Welcome to the Holistic Health Matters Podcast, where it's all about maximizing your health potential in body, mind, and spirit so that you can pursue the abundant life more effectively. I'm your host, David Sandstrom, naturopathic doctor and biblical health coach, and this is episode number 11. Today, we're going to be speaking with John Wood. John is the CEO and managing partner of U.S. Wellness Meats. John is one of the founding farmers of U.S. Wellness Meats, specializing in 100% grass-fed and grass-finished, sustainably raised beef, lamb, bison, elk, and dairy products. U.S. Wellness also carries wild-caught seafood, pasture-raised heirloom pork, and pastured free-range poultry. John started the family business 20 years ago and has seen it grow into a thriving online food service. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you for being here. Um, did I miss anything in there in your bio? No, the only other little comment, I guess I am a fifth generation Missouri farmer. My family goes back in uh, this part of the country to the 18, uh, 1848, I guess, when my ancestors settled in northeast Missouri. So uh, wow, I come from a pretty interesting lineage of pioneers. That's terrific. Good to hear that. All right. Well, we'd like to get to know you a little bit better. Um, tell us something interesting about yourself, although you just did. But is there anything else you'd like to add that some, most people don't know about you? Well, I guess I'm not a. I'm, I'm always a guy that takes the the uh, the untraveled path. That's one of my fortes. I don't like to go on the beaten paths. And uh, I can assure you, when we started this uh, concept, I actually read Alan Savory's uh, Holistic Resource Management, which is a outstanding read as far as environment environmentalism and taking care of the planet. He's still alive today. Great author, great speaker, has a great TED talk, by the way. And I read that in 1992 or three which kind of planted the seeds for U.S. wellness meats that didn't really take shape until year 2000. But we were trying to figure out how to generate more income, and and I actually had the concept that we could maybe produce grass-fed beef, and I read some research at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Mike Pariza had, had actually discovered CLA, which is kind of one of the magic compounds in, in an animal. It eats green forage all day long, and it's a fatty acid that fights cancer, diabetes, uh, puts on lean muscle, takes off fat, and good for the circulatory system. And I kind of had in my head, maybe we could actually use that as a selling point. And uh -huh. most people I talked to thought I was nuts, but I've... Uh, um, and then we we actually raised the first animal in 1997, uh, finished about five or six animals on forage, and took it to the local country locker. And the butcher says, "Yeah, I called the guy. I said, you know, I'm not a, not sure this is going to be fit for steaks. You know, it might just be ground beef. And he called me and said, well, it'll, it'll grade low choice. I said, oh, it can't grade low choice. Keep in mind, I came out of a family farm background of, of feeding cattle grain for 20, 25 years from 1975 to 2000 when I finally retired from that from that particular line of work. And um, it just it, this went against everything I've been taught to do for the previous, you know, or early 1970s. So we were surprised, and I went over and looked at it, and 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 sure enough, that ribeye was marbled, and it didn't have near as much back fat as the other animals hanging up in the cooler. But I said, "Well, go ahead and cut some steaks," and um, that's when we realized we thought we kind of had something because it was really pretty good. Yeah, we uh, we actually cut it with a plastic knife and a fork. It hadn't been aged more than six or seven days it wasn't long age like we do now but we were from the show me state of missouri you know and then and i thought it was just kind of a fluke i mean I, the odds of that and we kind of cherry picked the best animal of the five or six and did it again in 1998 and again in 1999 99 we did a little smarter we did half a dozen animals and sent samples off to iowa state and university of illinois to have them analyzed for mega threes and mega sixes and cla you really couldn't get a commercial cla test and very few labs could do that in, in uh, 1999 and it came back really really good the uh, don bites was a professor at iowa state who was uh, a good mentor for us and he was doing some research on cla using hydrogenated safflower oil which is not economically feasible in both pigs and and beef animals <clears throat> and the pigs have stomachs just like you and i and they had 25 percent less back fat and 10 percent larger loin eyes they were affecting the body composition and he was quite intrigued to get a real live sample of you know grass-fed beef off off of mother nature so to speak so mm -hmm. he encouraged us to continue so 
but you know, I was laughed at, and I guess one of my one of my, one of my points I kind of informed my children today. You know, if someone's laughing at you, you're probably on the right path. I mean, that's <laughs> most people would have would have not would have not had the courage to jump. And I also, from an airline perspective, I literally jumped out of an airplane at 30,000 feet and hoped the parachute was going to come open by the time we hit the ground because we didn't know what we were doing. We were we were in the forest amongst the trees, and we were trying to sell a product. Nobody knew what we had. And it was a slow, slow pull for the first two or three years. So that was the late 1990s? That's correct. It was... Uh, it was actually, uh, we formed the company in September of 2000. We're coming up on our 20th anniversary here shortly. Okay. But, uh, but that was, uh, uh, but the actual seeds were planted in the, uh, in the uh, you know, mid, mid to late 90s. We learned kind of how to manage the grass and manage the landscape, which was, we got pretty good at. Uh-huh. But, uh, John, I'm sure you remember more about this than me, but I was born in 1962, and I can remember the aroma and the taste of the beef that my mom used to cook. Every Sunday, she used to cook a roast in the oven. We'd go off to church, mm-hmm. and we'd have to, we'd have to get out of church. If the pastor went late, we were, we were worried that the roast was going to burn. But when we came home, I remember the smell of what that, that beef smelled like and tasted like. But that went away somewhere in the early 70s, I think. And it wasn't until I ordered some food from your farm that I said, that smells like my childhood. Mm-hmm. That smells like real beef to me. So I don't know when the you know what the time frame was. But here's the rest of the story. After World War II, there was a tremendous amount of ammonia nitrite laying around. They made bombs with, and uh, the War Department came to the Agriculture Department and said, "We got to get rid of all this stuff. We don't have a war to fight." And so they applied it to cropland, and corn yields doubled in 1946, 47, 48, 49, 50, and by 1951 or so, there was a glut of corn in the United States. Mm-hmm. What do we do with all this corn? And then they went to the land grant universities and said, "Gee, you know, we got a problem. Well, chickens just eat a you know a couple ounces a day, and pigs eat you know maybe two pounds a day or a pound and a half, whatever it is. And uh, and a, a big old thousand pound steer, you can put away twenty five pounds of corn a day. So they decided to start feeding corn to beef cattle." And paradigms take 20 years to change, so that all started in the uh, you know early 1950s, and by early 1970s, you know, grain feeding was a common common theme everywhere. That was easier to do and quicker and faster. Yeah. And so, that industry changed, and what you had in 1962, there was a lot of still quite a bit of grass-fed beef around in the early 60s, and my father. Has told me in the sand hills in Nebraska they would bring these June cattle off the rich spring grass, uh, three-year-old steers. They go to Omaha, Nebraska, and the fancy restaurants in New York and Chicago would bid on these cattle, and they were the grass-fed steers coming out of out of Nebraska and the in the upper Midwest in June and July. And then the same thing took place on the West Coast in California in uh, March and April, and the winter grasses on the West Coast, and that's where the best flavor came from. And, mm-hmm. And that's, um, but that's exactly what was going on. And and my father had the same comment that you had because he said this tastes like what we used to what we used to eat. Mm-hmm. So, and chickens are the same way. Once you eat a pastured chicken that's been raised outside on and, and done correctly, the key word is pastured chicken. You can buy a free range chicken, and it's usually raised in the building with an opening to the outside, kind of an exercise lot. And chickens are lazy; they don't hardly ever go outside. So, yeah. it's, but a pastured chicken is a magic word. And once you eat, once you eat pastured Pasture chicken, you'll never go back to back to the grocery store again. It's just a flavor difference. It's just stunning. I totally agree. And you know right away when you're cutting into it after it's cooked, the, the ligaments that hold the bird together are a lot stronger from mm-hmm. a pastured bird as well. So you know that this, this animal has has experienced a healthier life and you know there's more nutrients in that food when you know you're choosing what to put on your table to feed your family. You want an animal that's fed its its natural diet. Number one rule for healthy eating is eat food as close to its God-given natural form as possible. So when you treat and feed a, a, a chicken their natural diet, they're naturally healthier. Same is true with a, a cow or bison or elk or anything else, right? Absolutely correct. And uh, the only, only thing you have to be careful of, you know, in the Midwest, if you're a deer hunter or, you know, you know a lot of deer in the Midwest are actually grain-fed deer. They, pretty, they, they learn to 
to nibble in the cornfields. But uh, the interesting thing about the wild deer, given the choice of a GMO field and a non-GMO field, uh, several of my friends have commented they'll see deer damage in non-GMO fields. The deer seem to know what the difference is, which is interesting. And I have hmm. friends in Mississippi tell me the same thing, like the raccoons will not will not uh, go after GMO corn. They'll actually feast on, uh, on GMO corn if they have a choice, if there's a difference. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. The animals know the difference, but we don't. <laughs> How about that? So, for you, John, was it was it just getting back to your roots as far as farming goes, or how did you how did you have the idea to say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna go against the grain, we're gonna start feeding our animals uh, our cows grass and bring that to market? What what caused that uh, evolution of thought? Well, it, it didn't it didn't happen overnight, but I uh, <clears throat> I was um, you know involved in a family cattle feeding business, and we could see a little bit of the handwriting on the wall for the small independent producer. You know, we used to have five different markets, and it was four markets, and three markets, and two markets, and by the you know by the late 1990s, there was only one buyer in Northeast Missouri, and. Uh, and the family, you know, it was a large business and didn't really want to change a direction. And so I said, I think, you know, this thing might work. And so I elected to resign from the family business. I still own my, uh, it was through uh, through another family member in my, my home farm I grew up on, which is smaller acreage. I did purchase that in the early 80s, and I converted that to grass. And that's when everyone laughed at me. I mean, I was ridiculed. Uh, I just complete laughed at because I went away from the conventional agriculture and uh, but it didn't you know we it took us five or six or seven years to really develop a market but I was but what I figured out pretty quickly you know what we were doing was good for the land uh, the land was healing the, you know, the erosion problems went away um, we had a 2011 we had like 30 some odd inches of rain in the month of June and I've got several large lakes on my property. Not one of those lakes overflowed. And now every other lake in the county had spillway damage or just biblical type rains. And my soil was able to absorb a tremendous amount of water. And I had all this forage on the ground. So it was like a natural sponge. So what we were doing was good for the land. The animals are in utopia. You know, they move every day to fresh grass. And so they, you know, they see you coming on a little four wheeler. They they wait patiently, you open the gate, and they go in. Every head goes down. And, and so, so that's uh, they're very calm and very content, and, um, mm -hmm. and it's good for the rural community. There's a lot of interest in this now. Uh, we I was a founding member of the Grassfed Exchange dot com, which is kind of a clearinghouse for the grassfed industry. Grassfed Exchange dot com, and we've attracted a lot of young people. Um, we actually invite. Uh, we have some scholarships for high school and college students. We'll send them to the our annual convention every year. And it's, uh, you know, there's a, you know, this is a game that they can play. They can find it, you know, like, like a landowner that's wanting to retire. You can, you know, lease them the grass and, and oftentimes there's people with third parties that'll provide the animals. They provide the labor and management and the way to kind of bootstrap your way into, into agriculture. Right now, agriculture is very difficult to enter in the commodity world. There's just too much, too much overhead and cost involved. But in the livestock world, you can do it with goats and lambs and beef animals. And it's a, and it's a, it's, it's good for the environment. And we're actually trying to build soil. That's the other thing we really kind of tout here is that we're actually storing carbon, um, grasslands of the world are some of the best carbon sinks on the planet and uh, mm -hmm. you know if you go to, well Sabre's book is fascinating if you go to the deserts of North Africa if you go back a million years ago that was all grassland uh, before man became active on the African continent it was uh, managed by large herds of herbivores there was also a large predator population and interestingly enough the predators were the land managers because these animals all had to stay in a group they grazed in a group they slept in a group you know they dunged in a group and urinated in a group and then they moved on the next day <clears throat> because mm -hmm. that was the way and the predators took off the the weak and the injured or whatever that's kind of how the system worked man came along and uh, eventually reduced the predator population the point the animals lost their fear then you got into overgrazing and undergrazing and that's what messed up the carbon cycle in iraq for example there's 60 50 inches of rainfall a year in the tiger through frady's valley but it all falls you know and in, in like three or four months and then there's four or five months of dry and that's when you 
that's when the plants got messed up. You know, the overgrazed plants wouldn't grow. The overrested plants, uh, that's when it, that's when it turned into deserts, the desertification process. Same thing happened in Australia. Same thing's going on right now in the, in the American Southwest. The state of New Mexico is one of the most rapidly uh, growing deserts in the world today. I was a Boy Scout back in the 1960s, and I, I took some pictures up on top of Philmont Scout Ranch, and it was green. It was a green site out across the New Mexico prairie. Not that way today. Um, so the, the, the cycle is you take care of the soil, soil grows healthy grass, you feed healthy grass to the animals, produces a healthy animal, and those animal products produce healthy people. It makes sense. And then what happens when you start doing this, when you give this grassland uh, 30 to 45 days of rest between, uh, between grazing cycles, that allows the root system to go deeper and deeper. And every year I grow more and more grass on my property, and, uh, which is another fascinating side piece of this whole thing, is you, you watch the land get better in front of your eyes. I mean, it's just stunning how much more forage I produce this year than I did 15 years ago. And I tell anybody that's going to need to do this, you know, your your first mistake is you probably understock after the first two or three years. You don't have enough animal units out there to really make this thing work. And I'm a little bit that way myself this year. I've, I've, had, I've had longer rest cycles. <clears throat> and then what also happens, you bring back native plants and native prairie plants start showing up. And I've got blue stem and switch grasses and eastern gamma grasses. These are plants that you would have seen here back in the 1700s before this area was settled. And those those species are starting to come back on my property now, which is fascinating. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. So, John, would you, you take a minute to let, let the HM community know what happens to a cow when you feed them grains? What happens to their digestive system? It's a very simple story. The the animal that you feed grain to, it's a starch digestion, and the first, there are four stomachs in the bovine. You've got a rumen, which is a fermentation vat. You've got the abomasin reticulum and small intestine, the four stomachs of the bovine. When that animal is digesting starch, the pH in the fermentation chamber is four and a half to five and a half, very acidic. When you take the same animal and you feed it a forage diet, that pH goes up to pH 7, very, you know, 6.5 to 7. Huge difference. Well, the bacteria that ferment at pH 7, for example, all die off at pH 6. They're very sensitive to the pH, to the, to the acids in that in fermentation environment. So you've got the uh, grazing, uh, you know, fermentation bacteria, and you have the grain-fed fermentation bacteria, and they produce a completely different suite of fatty acids. The omega-6-3 ratio in that grain-fed animal is about 20 bad guys and one good guy. Uh, 20 omega-6 is 1 omega-3, and it can vary. It can be 14 to 1 or 18 to 1 or 20 to 1. The grazing animal, on the other hand, I've, I've had... I've actually had levels of one to one, six to three, two to one, three to one, four to one, um, three or four to one is kind of the average. So you have a much higher concentration of omega threes, which are anti-inflammatory. Omega sixes are inflammatory. You need a few omega sixes for the brain every day, but we get way too many omega sixes in our diet. So if you have arthritis problems, you know that, that omega six is going to aggravate that. Any you know any aches and pains is going to be aggravated by omega six. What's interesting, in, 19, in 2003, we got acquainted. We went to the uh, Fitness Expo or the Iron Man Expo in Pasadena. John Bielik, the owner of Iron Man Magazine, encouraged me to come out and participate in that. And after about the third day, the strong men came over, and these guys are <clears throat> Ode Hagen is still a legendary guy. He's in his 70s now, I suppose. But um, anyway, he brought two younger guys with him, and we had a conversation, and they wanted to – uh, they were trying to eat three to four pounds a day of ground beef, and they were going to a local uh, large box store, and they were buying that you know cheap ground beef, and they could only eat about two pounds a day, and they were constipated. They just wouldn't go through them, and they then we made a deal at a discount with them, and they started going. They were they were eating three to four pounds of ground beef a day. Um, uh, uh, John Anderson's wife would prepare a four pound meatloaf every morning for him, and he would eat eight slices a day during the course of the day. Went through them just like salmon. They were just ecstatic. Yeah. But the first the first thing they told me after about four to six weeks, it wasn't how much stronger they were. My elbows are better. My knees are better. My hips are better. I watched mm. John Anderson do a set of 10, 900 pound squats one day. I mean, it was just superhuman stuff. 
and uh, the, you know, the strain they're putting on their bodies. But they then after a year, each one of those guys, Jesse Maroney and Anderson, both put about 25 pounds of lean muscle on that frame they had. Wow. And then 2006, I think Jesse Maroney was the second strongest man in the world that was held in China. Um, but uh, they were interesting people. And so from the athletic community, we've, you know, we've, we've kind of gotten mixed up in several professional sports teams. And when you get around superior athletes, they will, um, you know, they're so sensitive to food. It's an interesting deal because uh, uh, the New York Jets, we started working with them 10 years ago. And Sal Alosi at that time was a strength coach and, and at, at the Jet facility back when we first got got acquainted but he was keeping pretty interesting records and they were having fewer entries quicker recoveries you know that you can plot all that and um we'll just say the team that won the world series last year we we fed them throughout the entire season and they had Excellent. the best record in baseball or they had the fewest mistakes and if you look at the seventh eighth and ninth innings the number of errors the batting average all those key statistics they were number one and they were eating high fat, um, you know, they were doing some neat stuff. I mean, they were sous vide and, uh, you know, pork roast and beef roast and and uh, chicken stock and, and, and marrowbone broth. I mean, it was just crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but stuff was, that we've been told were, for decades that so right. we need to stay away from. <laughs> and, if you, and if you go back to your to your ancestors, you know, they always had a stock pot on the stove. Mm-hmm. Uh, we sell a, we sell a, we call it a superfood chicken, chicken stock. And that lady, and there's an Iowa lady that introduced that to us. And it was her grandmother's personal, you know, recipe and been handed down to the family for 80 years. And, uh, you know, neat stuff. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just... And if you go back and look at our ancestors, there are no antibiotics to cover. Um, you know, they, they had and they learned that bone broths and chicken socks and all those sort of things were great for their personal uh, immune system. And they mm-hmm. they knew breastfeeding was good. The longer they did it, the better the immune response was. It was not uncommon in the 1800s to breastfeed for two years. And it was just from the standpoint of human health. Right. Yeah, I did an episode uh, not too long ago, um, we, and I talked about saturated fat and how uh, we've been misled when it comes to that, and we've got to get away from that term, artery-clogging saturated fat. It's just mm-hmm. not true. It's been debunked, and for some reason, the uh, the establishment, the uh, institutionalized advice we're getting from our federal government especially uh, is just not keeping up with the with the latest research, and we now know that we need not fear saturated fat. In fact, it's very healthy for us. As long as we we control our carbon intake with it, I think I'm probably one of the highest fat consumers in America. We we perfected pemmican bars back in 2003 or four, mm-hmm. and which is 55 uh, percent jerky, 45 percent pure beef tallow. I consume one or two of those every morning. I've been eating pemmican for breakfast for years, and uh, you know I I fill my tank with energy and a little dose of protein. And uh, mm-hmm. an interesting story on pemmican. If you go back, uh, John DeFlorio is a trainer out on Long Island. And he contacted me in 2003, didn't know, didn't know him from Adam. He said, can you guys make pemmican? And I said, well, I've heard the term. I mean, I knew it was a Native American staple. And so we made some in an angel food cake pan, my, one of my meat fabricators, and said, I'll take a swing at that. And, and, he, and he really liked it. So, But the story was, John DeFlorio was one of three American uh, coaches, strength coaches, that entered a lottery, there were a hundred some odd people entered a lottery and they pulled three names out of the hat and they got to go to Russia in 2002, I think. And they met with these strength coaches who were in their eighties and nineties and the Russians were the powerlifting champions of the world, you know, back in the 1930s, forties, fifties, and sixties. And they force fed those guys three to four pounds of pemmican a day. That was, that was a secret, wow. secret uh, sauce that they did. And then uh-huh. in the 1970s, they figured out steroids. They can inject people and get the response they wanted with that. But yeah, but the but if you go up into Siberia, they did the same thing as the Plains Indians did. They they made uh, they made pemmican. That was a common staple. But mm-hmm. uh, that 2.14 ounce pemmican bar sitting there with 200 and some calories and uh, 13, 14 grams of protein. And that's uh, we have several well-known athletes to carry that into clubhouses and uh, one's retired uh, 
uh, you know, uh, American League uh, uh, designated hitter, and he was uh, he was great, great fan of pemmican. He also would take marrow bones and put them in a in a in a pan with a little bit of you know grass fed butter and melt the marrow out and eat that like a soup. He was after mm-hmm. after all that fat. Mm-hmm. And, uh, my father ate. Uh, he passed away here a couple of years ago at ninety six, and he would eat a he did a stick of grass fed butter, you know, a quarter pound of butter. It seemed like every two or three days, his mind was sharp as attack all the mm-hmm. way in the end. I mean, it's just. And my mother believed the argument, you know, in the nineteen seventies that fats was bad, and she developed dementia, and uh, you know, refused to eat fats. And, mm-hmm. and I, I've always said, if you look at the fat intake in America on a bar chart, it started going down in the early seventies, and the dementia, Alzheimer's, followed the exact opposite went straight up. And, well, you know, the uh, the real the real enemy in fats today is the polyunsaturated fats mm-hmm. that, that uh, we call PUFAs. And they're mostly omega-6 because of vegetable oils. And everyone agrees that you're, if you get your omega-6 ratio above 10 to 1, omega-6 to 3 ratio, that is, above 10 to 1, that it's pro-inflammatory. And mm-hmm. inflammation is the root cause of a whole bunch of, uh, of ailments. And you mentioned dementia. Um, the brain needs cl- massive amounts of cholesterol. It's, uh, exactly. it's super important for, for brain function. If we don't, If we're not... Getting enough cholesterol in our in the in the food that we eat, our bodies will, will compensate by producing more. But uh, it's a very important nutrient. It's another another thing, another nutrient that's been demonized over the years that we need to shake off that the whole notion. No, and I'm I'm not an Eli Lilly fan. I uh, my mother's a prime example of that one too. She was told she had high cholesterol, and she took uh, took the statin drugs. And if you read the warning label, she pretty much met all those criteria. She used to walk three miles a day, and then the legs go, and then the muscles start to deteriorate, and it's just hideous what goes on there. And uh, mm-hmm. and um, another friend was um, a former Eli Lilly employee who was a research chemist. I'll think of his name here in a minute. He retired probably in 2000, but he said they had, a, and he, he was wearing, he was wearing Kelvar around. He'd actually talked about some of the stuff that he wasn't supposed to talk about. But one of those trials was a hundred thousand heart attack deaths. This was like late 1990s or early two. Uh, this was like, this is 2005 or six uh, uh, clocks off a little bit somewhere in there. They did a trial and they looked at a hundred thousand heart attack deaths and, uh, and the the higher percentage was actually people that had low that had low cholesterol levels. You know, it, it was just exact opposite of what we've been told to believe. So yeah, well, it's, again, it's I story. I talked about that in great detail. I believe it was episode nine that I, I talked about saturated fat and cholesterol, and there is a bad cholesterol, and it's called APOB. And that's the, the cholesterol that's a type of LDL cholesterol that will oxidize very easily. But saturated fat intake will increase your levels of APOA, which is shown to be um, neutral. It's, mm-hmm. it's not, uh, uh, that doesn't really uh, impact our inflammation, whereas the APOB will, will contribute to atherosclerosis. But that is not affected by saturated fat intake. So if you want to get some more information on that, go back to episode nine and listen to that one. Yeah, sounds like a good one. I mean, you've yeah. done your homework well, and uh, thank you. It's just um, you know, then. But the bottom line is, if, you, if, if this is also a hard one to swallow, I'm sure you discussed it. You know, if you're overweight, eating smart fats will take weight off of you. I mean, that's Absolutely. a hard thing for that's a hard subject for people to get their head around. But, right. Uh, when we've been hearing the opposite for 50 years, it's mm-hmm. it's hard for people to to break away from that. But uh, it's absolutely true. We've been misled. And uh, I go into the history on how that came into being, that whole lipid hypothesis came into being in that episode. So if, if that interests you, uh, go back to episode mm-hmm. nine and, and check that one out. So, John, I got another question for you. Um, remember the movie Back to the Future 2 where uh, the old Biff stole the time machine and he went back in time and met the young Biff and he gave him the sports almanac. And that almanac, that information drastically changed his future. So my question for you, John, is if you could go back in time and talk to the younger version of yourself when you're first getting started in your farming journey, what would you tell him? What would you tell the younger John? Well, first of all, I tell him to follow his passions and to follow his instincts, and uh, not be afraid of the unknown, and uh, 
And I think we were probably on the doorstep of several great discoveries in this food science world that we, you know, it's kind of everything's going to change here in the next, uh, in the next three to five years. There'll be things that come along in the next six months we don't see today, but not to be afraid to, uh, to be the first or, you know, not, not, not wait to be the last guy to go through the door, you know, like the paradigm shifts. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, being a, being, a not afraid of risk and not being afraid of failure. I guess not being afraid of failure. I've never been afraid of failure. I've often mm -hmm. I failed. I've been humbled a time or two, but I, uh, but I think if you, if you look at the soil and you look at the whole spectrum, everything revolves around our, our top soil in the world today. And, and sadly, we've got about a hundred year supply and, uh, that's why the grass fed exchange has really lobbied hard the last six or seven or eight years about soil re regeneration. We are, we are not being good stewards of a resource. We need to generate uh, soil. I live on the Mississippi river and the number of floods we've had in Northeast Missouri have increased a lot in my lifetime, you know, major flood events are occurring too frequently. And we're just, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to start, improving the quality of soil, but I think it starts right at the soil base and I would encourage anybody to really look at that resource. Uh, that's your, that's your, that's your gold, uh, gold standard right there. The better the soil, the better your, your, your chances are going to be. And mm -hmm. I, and I, I didn't really understand that when I started on this journey and it's one of the things that I look back on and I would have done a few things differently, but uh, it all starts with the soil. All right. Thank you for that. You know, here's another question I have, John. You know, you can go to the grocery store today and you can buy beef that's labeled grass fed. But when I do that, when I, I eat that meat, I can tell by the, the texture and the flavor that it's not grass finished. Can you talk a little bit about the labeling laws and, and what the difference between grass fed and grass finished actually is? Well, that's a real murky subject. Um, it's, inter it's an interesting story. In 2005, um, I, I may have my dates wrong, but somewhere between 2005 and 10, the USDA uh, waded into the grass-fed world, and at the um, at the encouragement, we'll just say, of a major some of the major players in the beef industry and they wanted it. It used to be grass fed was mama's milk and grass all the way to, all the way to harvest. Mm -hmm. And then they changed that. So the grass finished, it's kind of a new term and that indicates mama's milk and grass all the way to finish and grass fed got changed to the point that you could add some other feed sources to it, you know, in, in, in bad weather conditions or whatever. There was a little, there was a scapegoat set up into that. So that's why we say grass fed, grass finished. I use, in, in my mind, grass fed has always really hadn't changed, but the word grass finished is a new terminology. Mm -hmm. But uh, you need to be, you need to be, you need to ask some questions at the grocery store. You know, there are several companies out there that I do know that do it correctly, that do have, you know, that have, uh, bridged into those markets and the other thing that actually will affect flavor and texture is what we get into you know our animals are under the age of 30 months which is a young animal and if you harvest a harvest an older cow which will say she's six or seven years of age and if you're foolish enough to take the steaks out of that animal they're not going to eat as well they're going to be the texture is going to be different the sinew is going to be different you know unless they marinate that it's it's going to not going to be the best eating experience that's been one of our one of the things i've railed against for years that you just can't put that into the marketplace hmm. but there are some there are now then usda got out of the labeling game about three or four years ago because the heat got pretty hot in the kitchen and there are some things going on that they were might have been liable for and so they've they've backed out of it the american grass fed association's got a six or seven page you know rule book on what they call grass fed grass finished and my whole thing's always been very simple it should all be on one page it just you've got to keep the starch out of the diet mm -hmm. and uh, that's just pretty plain and simple if you had any sort of starch, and here and here's the rest of the story. If you had starch to that animal in the last 30 days of its life, and that's one of the old wives' tales. People thought, well, you have to feed them some grain in the last 30 days in order to, in order to get the flavor, which is completely taboo and opposite of what it should be. Right. Uh, and but 30 days of grain will remove almost all your good omega threes and your CLA. It changes that fatty acid composition dramatically. Mm -hmm. 
And then the other one is a book by Mark Schatzker called Steak. That was a New York Times bestseller about 10, 11 years ago. And I don't know where he found the money, but Schatzker is a Canadian, and he traveled in Canada, United States, went to South America, went to Europe, and he, he traveled with a team of biochemists. And they ate steak for I don't know how long it went on. But the very best steak that he found was in France. And it was a Scottish Highland animal, which is these things with really shaggy hair coats and horns about four feet long. And I was shocked that that was, you know, I wouldn't, that doesn't look to me like the, the perfect animal, but that's what they found the perfect steak. Mm-hmm. But he called, he called the magic in grass fed beef photolipids. That was a new term for me. And the photolipids, for like example, in a ribeye, when you eat a ribeye, you'll see the inner, You'll see the seam fat, which is what ribeyes are noted for. That's not the magic that gives it the wow flavor. It's the intermuscular fat that you really can't see. It's lipids that are within the muscle tissue itself. That's where the magic's coming from. Mm -hmm. That's where he said, you know, whatever area, and I'm assuming the Scottish Islander was probably in an area in France. It was probably higher elevation, Um, you know, cooler cooler summers, uh, cold nights, and that's where you see those animals anyway in the probably in the Alps area of France. Mm-hmm. But um, but that's where the magic comes from. It's called photolipids, and that's that's where you – but you cannot give them any kind of starch at the end. You just ruin everything. And I, I'm guessing at the grocery store – then there's an awful lot of product that's coming in out of Uruguay and Paraguay, and I've always been suspicious of that. There's a couple of companies that bring that in by the container loads in large quantities, and I've had some of that at a couple of trade shows or events we were at and it just never, you have no idea what you're eating there. You could be eating a young animal, old animal. I don't know how well it's created, but, mm-hmm. but uh, the where it comes from bears a story. And there are several good reputable companies that do it right. And they are trying to eke out a, a spot in that, in that commodity grocery store business. Uh, but I never have played there. Yeah. So the moral of the story is get to know your farmer just like we're doing right now mm-hmm. and and know where your beef is coming from and ask the right question, know how to ask the right questions because there are a lot of, uh, a lot of games being played with this uh, la- labeling is some, something might be legal, but it might not be morally uh, mm-hmm. accurate to, to state because all cows are grass fed at some point, you know, they get, they get weaned from their mother and they're out in the, out in the field at some point they're eating some grass, but, is that animal grass finished? And as you said, if you feed that animal uh, corn-based feed, which is starch-based, they're going to lose the, the the healthy components of the meat and the, and the dairy uh, in 30 days. It, it doesn't take long. That doesn't take long. No, that's the amazing part of it. It doesn't take long at all. And it takes 200 days to get put it in there, and you can you can have it all disappear in 30 days. Mm-hmm. And, and and you also you also ruin the flavor. I mean, the yeah. the real wow flavor is coming from those photolipids out of that we just discussed. That's mm-hmm. just, it's the stuff you really can't see. That's what's interesting about it. I mean, it's uh, like when you cook a burger, you know, and you cook a you cook a grass fed burger in that uh, that grease in the pan. I mean, that's 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 where the flavor is. Yep. We sell the sugar free hot dog, and it's just just a plain hot dog with minimal minimal ingredients. But you don't need ketchup. I mean, you don't need mustard, mm-hmm. you relish. I mean, that's just a really it good. It just tastes great. Yeah, I know. Good. I can I can testify to that. You get about 30% fat in those things, and uh, preferably 35, and all of a sudden, that's a really good hot dog. Mm-hmm. I can also testify to the pemmican you mentioned earlier. That stuff, I, I love those bars, and they give me a tremendous amount of uh, satiety. I, I don't have to eat for quite a while when I have a couple of those. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they really stick with you. No, they do, and if uh, and and in your world of travel, you know you can put those. Uh, you know the, those things are good. I've seen them sit around for thirty days on an office desk, just out of curiosity. You know, the people that make the pemmican for us, they're afraid to call it shelf stable, which means they need to dry the jerky down to about twelve percent moisture, which really hard to grind, hard on equipment, and then if you get a pinhole in the package, it could spoil. Yeah. So we don't make a claim, but I I will tell you another story. We actually sponsored a uh, a um, there's a yacht race that uh, it's uh, every four years i think when they leave the coast of france on july one it's a single man uh yacht race and it's pre-1968 technologies so they're using sextants they're not and, and they have <laughs> to catch rainwater i mean the old-fashioned way yeah and the uh, the gentleman that we sponsor or we or a partial sponsor but i gave him 300 pounds of pemmican and put in the hold of that ship. And he got back, he left July one and got back to France, I think at the end of March, he finished fourth. 
And there was like 20 some odd boats that left. Only five of them finished the thing. Uh, the storms and the bad weather and the Southern Ocean got, got most of them. But it was, wow. uh, but he was quite, he said, he, he, this is the second time he, and this guy came back. He was 66. The second time he'd done this, he did it 10, eight or nine years ago. He said he came back in far better health on this trip <laughs> and he, and he had troubles. He had some, he had some other mechanical problems. He fought all the way. But he said the pemmican saved him in the Southern Ocean. He actually ran out of water. He was drinking, you know, he found a couple of bottles of beer in the bottom of the boat and some nasty, you know, bilge water. And, but he said that there was enough moisture in the pemmican that he actually just to, to, to sustain himself until the next rain came along. He wow. was quite, uh, he That's, gave the pemmican, you know, kudos when he, when that he got is back. Quite a story. But we, actually, wow. we actually dried that extra dry. So, you know, we knew he was going to be out there a long time. You know, he, he raved about the pemmican. Wow. That, that, that's an amazing story. All right. Wrapping things up, John, um, is there a book that you would recommend to the WHM community that you might find and recommend as a good read? I would recommend they go to uh, TED Talks. Uh, I might give you two suggestions, TED Talks and Alan Savory. I think that's one, and it's, it's six or seven million views the last time I was on there. But that kind of would give them a sense of, of why I do what I do. Um, but it's um, – and then the other one, which is an interesting read, which I read 10, 11, 12 years ago, was The 100-Year Lie by John Fitzgerald. That's a book I used to carry around to trade shows. But it talked about, you know, the things we talked about this morning and where fluorides came from and why we had the cancer epidemic. And the, and the interesting story in that book, which is, I guess it's like I quote quite often, in 1900, there was only 2% of us that were diabetic. And you look at the diet we had in the 1800s, it was a high fat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, high fat diet, yep. and cancer wasn't discussed until the Mayo Clinic brought it up in 1923, and that was after Cargill forced the uh, the wheat growers in, in the Upper Midwest to, to do a change in wheat breeding to put more carbs put more carbs or starch into the kernel of wheat and fewer vitamins and minerals, and they dramatically changed the uh, nutritional uh, aspect of wheat. And by mm-hmm. 1923, we we fed enough bad bread in this country that we were actually starting to get into the cost and get into the heart disease world. So 100 yeah. year line by John Fitzgerald is an interesting read. And the most recent book that I've been reading is called breathe, which is a fascinating read about how we breathe and how it affects our health. And it ties into all the stuff we've just been discussing. So uh, it sounds terrific. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Definitely fits right into the holistic health model right there. So if this is all making sense to you and you'd like to get some of this healthy food for yourself, you can go to my website, davidsandstrom.com forward slash US Wellness. You can click on any of the links on that page and it'll take you to the US Wellness website. And you'll be supporting the podcast if you do, because I'll make a small commission. And if you make a purchase before the end of the year, John's going to talk about a special incentive that he has for the WHM community. So John, why don't you tell the listeners about that? That's... um that would be farm 15 would be the promo code f a r m the number 15 would be a promo code that'll give a 15% discount on orders under 40 pounds you got to keep the weight under 40 pounds and it's not going to discount sale items but it's a great way to save some money and uh, we have a wide variety we you know, we have we have beef and pork and lamb and bison and rabbit and and uh, chickens and, and turkeys and ducks. Um, everybody's got a good story behind it. We actually only work with people that have our same belief systems. And uh, we have wild-caught seafood on top of that. And so you can – it's an a la carte menu. You can – I one of anything. There's no there's no minimums you're required to buy or, or, or bundles. And hopefully within 30 days, we're going to have a subscription-based model out. We'll have a subscription uh, uh, also card available, which is what we've been working on for about a year. That's about to be about to come out of the about to come out of wraps. Oh, interesting! But I uh, I think uh, but your listeners are very astute, and I appreciate your knowledge base and what you're doing for your uh, for your for your coaching. And uh, I think we're a really good fit. We uh, we deliver or we ship on Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. We'll ship on Thursdays or Fridays if someone personally requests it. There's a little more risk at the end of the week. Uh, we have never been behind on shipping until uh, until mid March, and we got behind due to the madness that took place in March and April. And we finally got caught up, and we've been caught up and been on been on time here like, for the last six or seven weeks. Fantastic! And, uh, made some changes so we can uh, take a larger volume of business through here. Thanks.
start going crazy again. People are thinking about ordering online for all kinds of things these days, but uh, U.S. Wellness have been been shipping excellent quality products to your door for a long time, uh, way before COVID nineteen ever came into our our consciousness. You guys are doing it right. We have a really good relationship with FedEx, and we've been shipping a lot of things priority overnight here for the last uh, six or for the last three months. I just. Uh, um, we, we try to deliver next day, whether it's one day ground in the in the close proximity of Northeast Missouri, or but it's usually it's usually next day service. So we don't uh, we're not doing three and four day ground shipments. That's just a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you this too: I've been a customer for a long time, and the products always come uh, frozen. Well, not always. You can order fresh, but if you order the frozen product, it always comes rock solid. And the coolers that you guys use are just uh, amazing. The the thick uh, styrofoam cooler it just does a fantastic job, even in the summer. The product always shows up uh, frozen solid. It's a terrific product the way you guys package it. Hey, well, I thank you and uh, appreciate your compliments. And we've been at this a long time, and uh, you know we take a lot of pride in our work. You can call our office during the day. We've got uh, some outstanding professionals that enjoy the visit with customers. We can take your order over the phone. We can answer recipe questions, cooking questions, and we actually have a call center overnight. You can call at 3 in the morning and, and do the basic basic order of taking in the middle of the night. So we wow. try to be as accommodating as we can. Okay. And just to recap, if you'd like to place an order with U.S. Wellness, go to my website, davidsandstrom.com forward slash U.S. Wellness. Click on any of the links in that page and you'll go to the U.S. Wellness website. And when you check out, use the discount code FARM15. That's for you. You get 15% off your first order. All right, John. Well, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. I'm really excited to be a partner with U.S. Wellness on this health building journey. David, thank you very much. We're excited to have you part of our team and appreciate all you do for U.S. Wellness. Have a a super day. You too, John. Take care. Thank you. Very good. Bye. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with John Wood from U.S. Wellness. He is just a boatload of wisdom and information, and boy, I really enjoyed having him on the show. After we stopped recording, uh, we talked for about another 30 minutes. It was just uh, great to connect with him. What a what a great human being he is. Thinking about it, I'd almost like to have him back on the show where we could talk about living out your passion and your calling, because he's doing just that. He's doing what he loves to do, and it really shows. Don't forget to head on over to my website, davidsandstrom.com. This is episode number 11. And as always, you can read the full transcript of today's conversation. You can also download a PDF, take it with you, and read it later if you want. And I'll also include links to all the resources that John mentioned today in the show. I appreciate you. Thank you for allowing me to serve you today. And I'll talk with you next week. Be blessed.